Old Testament forgiveness concerning the law. And we're going to start in the book of Leviticus. So let's go back there. Leviticus chapter number four. And we're going to talk about the sin offering. Did it offer? Uh, well, I guess more specifically, how did it offer forgiveness of sin? And did it justify a man before God? I really believe the Bible teaches that salvation is the same throughout the Old and New Testament. God saves by his grace. There's teaching that gets sprinkled around that says that, well, in the Old Testament, they were saved by works, which I don't believe. <laughs> Uh, the Old Testament, they were saved by keeping the law, which I don't believe because nobody kept the law. <laughs> they were saved by the grace of God based on the truth that God had revealed to them. But in Leviticus chapter number four, I'd like to go over these verses or this chapter so that we have an understanding of where sometimes people draw um some of the text proofs out of when teaching forgiveness in the Old Testament. So let's get some understanding. Leviticus chapter number four, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them. If the priest. Okay. So this is now we're getting into. What are the requirements. For the priest. If he fouls up. That is anointed. Do sin. According to the sin of the people. Then let him bring for his sin. Which he hath sinned. A young bullock. Without blemish. Unto the Lord. For a sin offering. So verse 3. He was to bring a young bullock. That's an ox. Without blemish. Okay. He shall bring the bullock. Under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Before the Lord. And shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head. And kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed. Shall take of the bullock's blood. And bring it to the tabernacle. Of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation. And shall pour all of the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall take it off from it, all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call about the liver, which with the kidneys, it shall he take away. As it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offering, and the priest shall burn them upon the offer of the burnt offering and the skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung. And we have a hard time having to fetch wood for the wood stove. <laughs> we, we, this, this is pretty extensive. This is pretty extensive. Imagine. Take yourself back now and imagine. Doing all of this. Even the whole bullock. Shall he carry forth without the camp. Unto a clean place. Where the ashes are poured out. And burn him on the wood with fire. Where the ashes are poured out. Shall he be burnt. You know we got to make sure we take out our ashes. We're concerned about it. You know. Making a thing in the house. And then <laughs> you carry it out. You want to dump it properly so that you don't catch something on fire. And then the next thing you know, you're calling the fire department. And you think that that's complicated. God had some real specific things laid out here. 
That was the requirement for the priest if there was sin. Now, watch what the requirement was for the whole congregation if they sinned. I know we're reading a lot of Bible, but I want us to really get this. Verse 13. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly. And they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty. When the sin which they have sinned against it is known. Then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle. Of the congregation. So we see here the requirement for the whole congregation. It was the same thing. A young bullock was to be brought. Verse 15. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord. And the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord. That is in the tabernacle of the congregation and shall pour out all the blood, at the bottom of the altar, the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall take all his fat from him and burn it upon the altar. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this. And the priest, here it is, shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. That was the requirement for the whole congregation, and they had their sin forgiven. That's what we read. Now, in verse number 22, Well, verse 21, he shall carry forth the bullock without the camp, burn him as he burned the first bullock. It is a sin offering for who? For the congregation. So, so we got that. So we had two things so far. We had the requirement for the priest. Then we had a requirement for the whole congregation. They sin. And now we have verse number 22, the requirements for the ruler. Let's look at that. Um. When a ruler hath sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty. Uh, Numbers chapter one, there's a there's a there shall be a man of every tribe. So if you are a ruler of the tribe, this would pertain to that person. In Numbers 34, it lays out the princes of the tribe. So if you are a ruler of a tribe or if you are a ruler of a division that was part of that tribe, these verses now apply to them. Or if his sin, verse 23, wherein he hath sinned, come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. So now we see they had to bring, not a bullock, not an ox, a kid of the goat was what they had to bring. A male without blemish, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they killed the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering. And he shall burn all his fat upon the altar as the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin. And it shall be forgiven him. There's an atonement made by the priest. And it says for his sin, it shall be forgiven him. Requirement for the priest, we saw first. Requirement for the whole congregation, we saw second. 
requirement for rulers, we saw third. And then lastly, in Leviticus 4, God lays out the requirements for the common people. Look at verse 27. And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth something against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin which he hath sinned. So now we've got an offering that's a kid of the goats that's a female, not a male. And God had this was was very specific on what was to be brought. And it goes on, he shall lay upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in place of the burnt offering. Verse 30, the priest shall take the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of the burnt offering. He shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. Verse 31, he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from all the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a suit saver unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him. And here it is again. And it shall be forgiven him. If you bring a lamb for sin offering, he shall bring it a female without blemish. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay it for a sin offering in the place where they killed the burnt offering. And the priest shall take the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it upon the horns of the altar of the burnt offering, and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offerings. Priests shall burn them upon the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. Priests shall make an atonement for his sin that he hath committed, and it finishes with, it shall be forgiven him. We see the same thing. The priest makes an atonement, and their sin is forgiven. A couple of things to note. Number one, we got through Leviticus chapter number four. The, the Old Testament passages aren't the most exciting, but they're very detailed. And a lot of times the detail bogs us down. You see a lot of repeat material. But what do we notice? All of this sin, the first thing I'd like to point out was through ignorance. Look at verse number two. Look at verse two. In the middle of the verse, if a soul shall sin through ignorance. Look at verse number 13 for the whole congregation. Uh, and if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance. Look at it for the ruler. Go down to verse number 22. When a ruler hath sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments. Look for the common people. Look at verse number 27. And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance. So first, all of this sin was through ignorance. And all of the forgiveness that was given was given through that specific sin. The atonement was made for that specific sin and the forgiveness was made for that sin. There's no implication in, in the entire chapter where they're getting full atonement and full forgiveness of all of their sins. And that offering, it took care of the consequences that would come from that sin. I want to come back to that thought and come back to a few of those thoughts. But let's go over to Leviticus chapter number five. Leviticus chapter 5. And if a soul sin, see that and hear the voice of swearing. Uh, verse number 2, and if a soul touch any unclean thing. Uh, at the end of the verse, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Uh, it, verse number 4, or if a soul swear pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good. Verse number five, and it shall be when he shall be guilty of one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. 
and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he hath sinned. And it goes on and, you know, verse seven, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Verse number nine, he shall sprinkle the blood of the sin offering. Verse number 13, and the priest shall make an atonement for him as touching his sin, that he hath sinned in one of these. Verse number 15, watch it again. If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance. Verse number 16, at the end of the verse, and the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and it shall be forgiven him. And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, no, he wist it not, meaning wist, just know it not, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. And he shall bring a ram without blemish out of the flock with the estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his ignorance wherein he erred and wist it not, know it not. And it shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering. He hath certainly trespassed against the Lord. This sin here is out of ignorance. It's hidden from the person. That sin's revealed. The person is guilty. And a sacrifice has to be offered for that specific sin. Now let's get Hebrews 10. Try to slow it down and tie some thoughts together. What we read in Leviticus was you had an atonement for some sin, but you didn't have an atonement for all the other sins. And so what you would end up with was if those, well, let's read Hebrews 10, then I'll make the comment. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. And then, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once heard sin have had no more conscious of sins. But in those sacrifice, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice an offering what thou, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast. No pleasure. You would have to spend, according to Levitical law, you would basically have to spend your entire life, every waking minute, making a sacrifice because you couldn't live your life without sinning. It would be a circle you would never be able to get off of. Hebrews 10 tells us we're not justified before God by those animal sacrifices. Which begs the question, so why the animal sacrifices? Which begs the question, so what is this forgiveness about? If it could never take away sins, yet the priest is making an atonement for sins and they're getting forgiveness of the sins. But Hebrews 10 tells us you don't need it because it can't take away sins. How do you rectify? How do you bring all that together? Well, we asked some questions. Number one, what was the purpose? Of the Levitical law. It was to govern that nation. It was given 
for some civil order. It was given so that nation would be what? Set apart and different from other nations, which, by the way, we can make the application today as New Testament Christians. Why are we so concerned with looking at the world and trying to match what they do? Why is there an attraction there for some people? Talked a little bit about it this morning, but we are a peculiar people. We don't think like the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't dress like the world. We don't listen to the world's music. And we don't fellowship like the world fellowships. We're Christians. We're different. We're set apart. We're sanctified. That's what it means. This Levitical law system, when they obeyed and followed it, it showed that they reverently worshipped the Lord. You, you know, kids and, and young people, and I can think back when I was a child, the young person, you know, my dad had some laws. I want you to go shovel the snow off the driveway. In the summer, the law is you've got to go mow the grass. You've got to get up by 530 so we can be at the farm at six so we can do our work all through the summer. I thought I can sleep in for the summer, Dad. No, the law is you get up. <laughs> Those laws were given to me by my father. And if I obeyed those laws that my father gave me, I reverently showed respect to the law giver. And when I didn't follow those rules and those laws, I wasn't showing respect and reverence to the law giver. And many times judgment came down <laughs> for not following those rules and those laws. The nation was given laws and rules by God. And when they reverently feared God and respected God, they were able to show that in worship to God by following those laws. And the forgiveness that they received from God was spared judgment as a consequence for that sin. God didn't strike them dead. <laughs> okay? It has nothing to do with them being justified before God, but it gave them their rights back into Jewish society. And that's why they obeyed and followed these laws. All of the forgiveness was given because it would welcome them back into the tribe, into the community. In other words, fellowship on earth with the other Jewish citizens could now be restored because that offering was made for that sin. But none of it justified them before God. It was a way to worship and show reverence to Almighty God. It didn't justify them before him. Numbers chapter 14. Let's look. Let's look there. Let's look at Numbers 14, and, and, and I think we can make the point here as well. And I want you to notice he's not forgiving them and declaring them righteous before him. Watch this. Numbers 14. Numbers 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God would have died in this wilderness? 
And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain. Let us return unto Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel and Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, were which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us. Then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation. Before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses. How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit, and disinherit them. And will make of thee a greater nation. And mightier than they. Verse number 12. What do we have given from God? That's the judgment. That's God's judgment that he says he's going to do. Verse 13, and Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For they brought us up this people in thy might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that the Lord art among this people. That thou Lord art seen face to face. And that thou cloud standeth over them. And that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud. And in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man. Then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak saying. Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them. Wherefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee. Let the power of my Lord be great. According as thou hast spoken saying. The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of under the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according under the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word i know we read a lot verse number 12 that's the judgment god's going to give them on earth verse number 20 he says i'm going to pardon you i'm going to withhold my judgment in other words the consequences that you people have merited yourself here on earth i'm going to pardon you and that's what he does in verse number 20. The consequences that they would have suffered in society, God pardons them. It didn't make them righteous before God. It had to do with God's pardoning forgiveness and a withholding of the consequence that they should have got. And guess what it was given according to? We see that uh, in verse number 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy. It's the greatness of thy mercy. And you know what we see in Numbers chapter 14? We see nothing like we saw in Leviticus 4 and 5. There was no offering made. No sin offering was brought at all. But watch what happens in verse 23. Uh, verse 21 will start. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. 
Because all these men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it, but my servant Caleb. Because he had another spirit with him that followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land where, uh, whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Okay, we saw 12, verse 12, Jug we saw verse 20, his pardon, and then we see the consequence that they get on earth as well. Y'all ain't entering in the land. It all had to do with their life on earth. Not a pardoning and not a forgiveness and not a righteousness made before God. God is not keeping an account of how many times we've tempted him. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without what? The deeds of the law. That's right. Without the deeds of the law. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. All of that has to do with our forgiveness and justification before God. Hebrews 11, Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, all a roll call of faith. They were made righteous before God by placing their faith in the truth that God had revealed to them. They were not made righteous by keeping the law. They were pardoned. They received forgiveness for that sin, but they had a whole bunch of other sins. And all of that pardoning and all that forgiveness was tied into consequences given or not given. Judgments coming down or not coming down. Because of their sin. Let's do one more. And then we'll be done. Psalms 51. We'll do this last one. We'll close it out. Psalms 51. Let's find out what David is trusting in. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. It's God's mercy he's trusting. In. Verse 2. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David's not offering any off sin offering. It's all God's cleansing against thee. The only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part thou shalt make it, make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He's trusting God to do the purging. He's trusting God to do the washing. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. He's trusting God to do the blotting. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in with me. He's trusting God to do this. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors. Thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. He's trusting God to restore him. Deliver me from thy blood guiltness, O God. Thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips. And my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Thou desirest not sacrifice. Else would I give it. 
Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. He didn't bring a sacrifice. He didn't bring an offer. He just trusted God. He believed God would cleanse him and could cleanse him. Everything we see in, in, in Hebrews 11, none of them, none of them were justified before God by a sacrifice or an offering. It was all by faith. It's all by faith. Salvation in the Old Testament, God saved them by grace when they put their faith in God. Well, did they trust Jesus? That's his name for humanity, okay? We're saved by grace, but we have a more sure word of prophecy where we have everything that we can go to that we need to go to. What do you think? David went to the book of Ephesians? You think he went to Titus chapter 3? You think he went to Romans chapter 10? No. No. But by faith, God has always and will always bless faithfulness. And when by faith you put your trust for us, by faith, we put our trust in Lord Jesus Christ. He will save us by his grace, by his grace. All those Old Testament sacrifices, yes, there was an atonement made for individual sins. Didn't merit them righteousness before God. All it did was give them favor from God. They were able to worship God. God withheld a judgment that he would have pronounced on them on the earth. 